And the man looked over to his wife and said, you know, honey, I've noticed that you make me angry sometimes. And, and when I get angry, sometimes I raise my voice and I stomp around and I pout. You know, there's all these outward expressions of my dissatisfaction. And it's just written all over my body. And I don't understand because I know that you get mad at me, but you always stay so calm. And I can never understand why. She said, well, when I get angry with you, I clean the toilet. And he kind of looked at her with a puzzled voice, and he says, well, or a puzzled look, and he says, well, how does that help? And she said, I use your toothbrush. <laughs> so uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about marriage killers. Now, just to get you up to speed, in case this is your first time with us or you missed the other uh, sermons in the series, we started out trying to define marriage. And we said that marriage is a covenant, first with God and then to another person, to treat them in a certain way. So marriage is about promise-making and promise-keeping. And we said that the way that we promise to treat the other person uh, is what the Bible calls agape love. And it's an attempt to build them up, to be a blessing to them, to enrich their lives, to help them become more fully the, God, the person God has created them to be. And in addition to that, we went on to talk about how can we be a blessing. So in the first sermon, we talked about the necessity of being a blessing. And then in the second sermon, we talked about love languages, love tanks, and love banks, and about how we can get to know uh, better the way that our partner receives love so that when we actually try to be a blessing, something connects and it actually works. Okay? And then last Sunday, uh, we, had, uh, we had a message about the meaning and significance of sex, and we talked about how sex can be a primary way that we can be a blessing to our spouse. And we said that sex is not just about pleasure, but it's about giving our whole person uh, through that intimate act to another in a way that can actually serve as a vehicle of God's powerful, healing, and loving presence in your partner's life. And so we've talked a lot about the meaning of marriage. We've talked a lot about how to be a blessing. But, um, but we also have to be honest about what are the things that kill a marriage. Because if we are not careful, uh, these things can sneak up on us in very cunning ways can drive a wedge between us and our spouse and can actually destroy the love between us. And this morning I want to just briefly talk about the three leading causes of divorce. And they're up here on the screen, or actually up here on the screen. And uh, number one, the number one leading cause of divorce is adultery. And we're going to talk a little bit about what God's response to adultery is. The next is addiction. That's the second leading cause of divorce. And the third is abuse. And we're going to talk not only about the obvious physical abuse, but we're also going to talk a little bit about emotional and verbal abuse as well. So let's start with, uh, with abuse. We'll start with number three, and then we'll work our way up to number one. If you didn't know already, it could be shocking to realize that every 10 to 15 seconds, a woman is battered by her husband or boyfriend. Did you know that? And in addition to being battered, three or four women every single day die because they have been abused by their husband or boyfriend. And, you know, when we turn on the TV, sometimes we see news reports where uh, someone has gone crazy. Uh, this just happened recently with an NFL football player. Uh, they get angry. They go get their gun. They shoot their spouse, and then they retreat to somewhere else and take their own life. And we're tempted to think that, that these extreme cases of abuse are really the only forms of abuse, and that they're rare, that they don't happen very often until we see them come uh, onto the TV screen. But I want to tell you that emotional and physical abuse is much more common than you might think. And in fact, statistics show that of all the people in this room, Someone here has either been the victim of abuse in the past, or an abuser, or is currently an abuser or being abused. And so we might think, well, surely this doesn't happen in the church. I want to tell you, I grew up in a very small church, and there was a guy um, who was a devout, devout Christian. 
and some would call him an extreme an extremist. I mean, he was a he was a radical Christian, and um, and he went to the Bible and found the passage that said, "Spare the rod, spoil the child," and he used that as legitimation for beating the tar out of his son. And so we can't say this doesn't happen in the church. It happens in the church. Sometimes it's very secretive. Other times people try to misuse Scripture to legitimate the abuse of their spouse or their children. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But let's just first try to get a working definition of emotional abuse. Now, we all uh, get into fights, and we all say things that we don't mean. But, but emotional abuse is the systematic tearing down of another person. It is when someone says over and over again, you're worthless, you're ugly, you'll never amount to anything. Right? And, it, and, and emotional abuse takes many, many forms. It takes uh, the form of belittling, demeaning, insulting, and uh, when all that stuff happens, then the abuser starts getting nervous that the person might leave, and so it leads to very controlling behavior where the abuser wants to control every move. I have to know where you are at all times. Um, and so emotional abuse uh, hurts. And, you know, we teach our children the little rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie. Words do hurt us. <clears throat> and when someone insults us, sometimes it feels like we've been punched in the gut. It takes the wind out of us. And, uh, and sometimes, when someone insults us, it hurts so much, we'd rather be punched in the gut. Have you ever had that experience before? If you have, raise your hand. I mean, I've, I've had someone insult me, and I say, hey, just punch me in the face. It would have hurt a lot less. Right? And so words can hurt. And oftentimes, uh, when people are engaging in emotional abuse, they're insulting, they're demeaning, they're controlling, uh, they're tearing the other person down, uh, sometimes when the abuser feels like they've got control of the situation, then the emotional abuse can turn into physical abuse. And we know what that looks like, right? It's pushing someone against the wall, slapping them, punching them, kicking them, pulling their hair, hitting them with objects. And, um, and oftentimes uh, what happens is when, when, when the abuser turns to physical abuse, it's quickly followed by remorse. They feel bad about what they've done. They say, honey, I'm so sorry. You know, I just lost my temper. I'll never do that again. And oftentimes, the person that's being abused uh, will, will make excuses for the abuser. And they'll say, you know what? He or she, they just got a quick temper. You know? but, but, but other than that, they're a pretty good person. And so, you know, I'll just try uh, to be a little... Uh, a little calmer around them because maybe it was my fault. You know? Maybe I did something that, that triggered their temper, and so maybe it's my fault. And so oftentimes, uh, not only is the physical abuse followed by remorse and apologies from the abuser, but the one that's being abused will often accept those apologies and then begin to make excuses for the person. And what we know statistically is that when emotional abuse, or when it's right out of the gate physical abuse happens, and someone is hit, it is much more likely to happen a second time. And when it happens a second time, it's much more likely to happen a third time, and a fourth time, and so on. And I want to say this morning that uh, the conflict itself is not bad. Conflict is actually inevitable. If you, if you have a relationship with someone for longer than about 20 minutes, uh, you are open to the possibility of having uh, a difference, having uh, a disagreement, and maybe even having an argument. And, and so it's not that we have to try to avoid conflict. And you know, conflict avoiding can lead us to repress our bad feelings, and then later on can come out sideways uh, in bursts, either angry words or physical abuse. So we don't want to be conflict avoiders. But what's important is how we handle the conflict, how we fight with each other. And uh, one of my, uh, well, one of the foremost authorities in marriage and couples counseling is a psychologist named John Gottman. And Gottman uh, has developed a way of being able to predict with 91% accuracy 
within five minutes of talking to a couple who will stay married and who will divorce. And do you know how he figures this out? He listens to the way they talk to each other. Within five minutes of watching a couple interact, he can predict with 91% accuracy who will get divorced and who will stay married. That's a pretty high uh, accuracy, isn't it? And he says that, uh, that what happens is when people fight, um, there are four things that they do that are more destructive than anything else. He calls these the four horsemen of the apocalypse in a marriage. Okay? And this is what they are. Number one, criticism. He can look at a couple, and he can, he can watch how husbands and wives interact, and if there is persistent, chronic criticism, he does this, she does that, she nags me, I can never hang out with my friends. All this criticism builds and is an indicator of who will stay together and who will divorce. Uh, the next one, the second uh, horseman of the apocalypse is contempt. It's when you get angry and you don't work through that angry, that anger, and you get bitter toward the other person, and you look at them with contempt, and you feel contempt toward them. The third horseman of the apocalypse is defensiveness. When uh, your spouse comes up to you and says, honey, you got a little mustard on your collar, and that person goes, are you calling me ugly? Right? Uh, we, we, all, we all experience this, and we all know people that we go up to them and we try to give gentle uh, criticism to tell them what their growing edges are. And the minute that you say something, it's like you're, you're personally attacking them. And husbands and wives can get into this cycle in which they simply cannot talk to each other about what they're feeling if those feelings are negative. And then finally, and this is sometimes a bigger problem for men than it is women, the fourth horseman is stonewalling. That's when you get so angry that you just check out and you put a wall between yourself and your partner and you ignore them and you refuse to emotionally connect with them. And Gottman says uh, it's not conflict. We're all going to have conflict. We're all going to argue and fight in our marriages. It's how we do it. And, uh, and that's really important. So if we remember what is the meaning and purpose of marriage, which is to build another person up, we realize that abuse, whether physical or emotional, does just the opposite, doesn't it? It tears the person down. Instead of relating to them with agape love, we communicate the message with our words and actions, you are worthless, and you're nothing without me. And so let's look this morning at what God's response to this is. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Part of the scripture reading is going to be on the screen, but I'm going to read a couple extra verses here. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to start with verse 29. This is so important. And let me tell you, if you're not married, this verse still applies to you. If, even if you're not in a, uh, in, a, in a dating relationship or in a long-term committed relationship, moving toward engagement, it doesn't matter. This applies to you because let me tell you something. When people don't adhere to this command in Scripture, it not only ruins marriages, it ruins friendships, and it will destroy a church. It will destroy a church. So listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 beginning with verse 9. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And this is so important. Listen to what Paul says here. Get rid of all bitterness. All rage and anger. Get rid of brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. So we see here that according to Scripture, we are not to tear people down with our words or our actions. We are to build them up and be a blessing to them. And this is so important in a marriage to try to build up and be a blessing to your spouse. And I want to tell you that there are some men 
who try to use scripture to legitimate controlling and abusive behavior. Because in this very book of the Bible, Paul goes on to say, women, be submissive to your husbands. And they'll take that one verse, they'll rip it out of context, and they'll say, you have to submit to me. And that means that I can control you, and it means that I can, I can batter you. If that means that, uh, that, that, that I, in my mind, I think it might somehow benefit you. And let me tell you something. This way of interpreting Paul is antithetical to what he meant. And we have to go back and remember that before Paul says, wives submit to your husbands, he tells us that we have to submit to one another. It is mutual submission. And then he goes on to say, husbands, love your wives just as Christ has loved the church. And Christ loved the church so much, he died for it. So husbands, you are called to be willing to lay down your life for your spouse. And so we have got to, uh, to disabuse people of this inappropriate misinterpretation of Scripture that is used to legitimate verbal and physical abuse. And you know, other people use Jesus' prohibition against divorce as a way of keeping those they're abusing in the relationship. And they'll say, you know, you can't divorce me. You, know, you can't divorce me because I'm abusing you because it says in the Bible that God hates divorce. And you know what? God hates divorce because God hates any time that relationships are broken. But do you know what God hates worse than divorce? <laughs> Abuse. And I would stand firm this morning and I would say, if you came to me for pastoral care and you said that you were a real victim of abuse, not someone who's had an argument and, and someone called you a name and, and it's a one-time thing, but if you, were, if you were genuinely a victim of abuse, I would say to you, get out and get out now. And I believe that if Jesus Christ were standing next to me, Jesus would tell you the same thing. You know? Because sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes people marry abusers. They know they're abusers. Other times, uh, the abuser is, is, is good at putting on uh, a nice shellac, right? And they, they look good until the person gets into the marriage. And then all of a sudden, uh, there's abuse that comes pouring out. But I don't believe that two wrongs make a right. Now, I don't believe that if you marry someone who is abusing you, that God wants you to live in that hell. So... If you are being abused today, we're going to put a number up on the screen. We want you to write that down. <clears throat> you can call that number and someone will help you to figure a way out, to give you counsel and help. And I want to say once again, God's heart breaks into a million pieces when someone abuses one of his children. And it's simply something that the church should not tolerate. And if you have a problem with anger, if you are the one doing the abusing, you need to get help too. And there is grace, and there is forgiveness, and there is healing. Your marriage can be healed if both people will get the help that they need. And if you are an abuser, either an emotional abuser or a physical abuser, I want you to come and talk to me in private. And I will connect you with sources that will help you heal and get free from the violence that pervades you. So that is the first killer of marriage, is abuse. One that is more prevalent, however, is addiction. And, uh, and I want to just briefly share with you the dynamics of addiction. I used to have a nice little laser pointer, and I, could, I looked all over the place this morning. I probably was using it to torture my cats a few years ago. But I'm going to make my way up to point a couple things out on the screen, because this is really important. What you'll see here is that addiction always begins, if you look at the top, with a particular behavior that gets associated with pleasure. And so you might be out with your friends, and you're not really necessarily in any kind of pain, you're just having a good time, you have one too many, and it feels good. And even if you're not fully conscious of it, something registers in your mind if I take this drink or use this substance or engage in this behavior, it's going to make me feel good. And after a while, what happens is that the behavior gets associated not only with the immediate pleasure, but then it gets associated with other kinds of experiences. 
And so where if it's once hanging out with the fellas or a girl's night out and it feels good, then one time you might stumble across some discomfort. You might say, you know what, I feel a little depressed today. And then you might use alcohol or drugs. And then you'll start associating the substance or the behavior with helping you deal with your problems. You see the shift there? It's a very subtle shift. From let's do this, it's pleasurable, to now I feel uncomfortable, so I am going to seek out the effects of the substance of the behavior to make me feel better. And this leads to increased frequency because now we have more reasons to drink or do drugs or engage in the behavior, uh, the behavior like gambling or pornography, and it reinforces the behavior. But after a while, you build what's called tolerance. <coughs> And so the more that you use the substance, uh, the less impact, the less intense the effects. And so instead of having to have two or three beers to feel good, you've got to have six or seven to feel good. And then eight, nine, ten, twelve to feel good. Instead of smoking a joint every once in a while, you've got to start smoking pot and go to bed at night so you can sleep. Right? And, so, um, and so you develop a tolerance, which means you have to engage in the behavior more, and you have to have more of it. Does that make sense? Then, at some point, somebody interferes with your using. Right? Uh, if you're a drug user, you might run out of money to supply your habit. Or your dealer might get busted, and the source dries up. Your spouse might look at you and say, you know what, I've had it. And if you don't get help, I'm leaving you. Or you might hit your body, and you might think, oh my gosh, look what my life has come to. I'm miserable. But at some point, something is going to interfere with the addiction. But guess what that does? That creates more discomfort. And how have you trained yourself to deal with discomfort? more of the substance or the behavior. And what ends up happening is that this cycle goes right back to pleasure, relief, dealing with problems, unless the person says, I'm ready to quit. But when they decide to quit, the battle's not over. Because then they have to endure withdrawal symptoms. And those are sometimes difficult, well, they're always difficult to deal with. And many people relapse and get right back into this cycle. Now, I want to speak just for a minute about the impact on addiction. I've never been addicted to alcohol and drugs, but I'm going to be, I'm going to be vulnerable this morning and share a story with you. When I first moved back to Florida, I got a church in Winter Haven, and it's very difficult as a pastor to date because you never date anybody in your church or anybody connected to anybody in your church, and as a teacher, you never date students. And so I got on Match.com, and I met a young lady in Tampa, and we developed a long-distance relationship. And it took me about eight months to realize that she was an alcoholic. By that time, I had fallen in love with her head over heels. And, uh, and let me tell you something. It was one of the most miserable experiences that I ever had trying to get her help, because she wasn't ready. I felt helpless. I stayed in the relationship. My first thought was, you know, when she's sober, she's a really great person. It's like, it's like the relationship fell from heaven when she's sober. And so maybe, you know, we all have our problems and we all have our vices. So I'll just, I'll just let her get drunk and maybe adapt my expectations and just try to focus on the good times. You know what that's called? Enabling. Right? And... Uh, and then at some point I said, you know what, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you, if you are a substance abuser or if you're an addict and you're not in treatment, you are creating an emotional torture chamber for the people that love you. And that's what it was. It was like emotional torture. And then finally, when I said, I can't do this anymore, I've got to get out, then all the guilt started getting poured on me. You don't love me. How can you leave me at the worst time of my life? You know that I've got an alcohol problem. You, I can't quit unless you stay with me. And the guilt gets poured on me. Guess what? I'm a pastor, so it's even harder. Because how can you leave? You're a pastor. You're supposed to stay with me and pray for me and help me through this. And it creates a living hell. And so not only does it create a living hell for the adults in your life, but if you have children, you are wrecking them. And let me tell you why. As adults, 
we have the faculties of critical thinking. And we can figure things out. And then we have the verbal skills to be able to communicate the bad feelings that we have. And we can get in our car and we can drive to see a friend or we can drive to see a therapist and we can talk it out. And at the end of the day, we can decide to leave. Kids don't have any of this. All they experience are horrible, horrible feelings of anxiety. And they have no idea where it's coming from because they can't figure it out. They don't have the intellectual ability to figure it out. They don't have the verbal skills to share their feelings. They don't have a way to get themselves to a therapist or an, an Al-Anon meeting. And at the end of the day, they can't leave. Which means, if you are active in an addiction and not seeking recovery and you have children, you have essentially put your child into captivity. You're chaining them up in the basement, so to speak, and submitting them to torture every single day of their life. Now is the time to change. And let me tell you, if you are an abuser, if you have, a, if you have an addiction problem, there is help. There is help at this church. There are people who have started an AA meeting that meet here every Saturday night. And you can come and you can be a part of that. If you say, you know what, I don't want to be at the, at the, uh, at the AA meeting at Shepherds because people might recognize me. Uh, there are meetings all over Lakeland. There are meetings in Winter Haven, Arvindale, Tampa, Orlando. And if you say, you know what, uh, I'd rather have uh, a more explicitly Christian model. Highland Park Church of the Nazarene offers celebrate recovery every Saturday night, and they have, they have interpreted the 12 steps in explicitly Christian ways. There are therapists that can help you. There's, there's all kinds of help out there. And if you are struggling with addiction right now, and you want to stop, then I want you to call me, and let's find a place to get you connected and start experiencing some healing. Last thing about addiction. And if you are struggling with addiction this morning, I want your ears to perk up. This is the most important thing you're going to hear me say this morning. Jesus died a torturous death on the cross in order to set you free from all forms of slavery. Amen. God does not want you to be enslaved to anything that is going to cause you to self-destruct and to hurt other people. And let me tell you something. When Jesus sets you free, you will be free indeed. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. The third, which is actually the first, the leading cause of divorce is adultery. I want to tell you that out of 150 cultures, adultery is the number one reason why marriages end in divorce. And, uh, and if you want to know what the Bible says, it's pretty clear. It's in the Ten Commandments. And you can't get much clearer than, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay? And in fact, in the Old Testament law, there were provisions for people to be executed if they committed adultery. Now let me tell you, and I don't advocate that by the way, uh, just in case you're wondering. Let me tell you, think about this. If a behavior is on the top ten list, okay, if a behavior is on the top ten list, and the, uh, and the consequence of it is the death penalty, don't you think this might have been a pretty big problem uh, in the ancient world? You see, we, sometimes we seem to think, well, adultery is more prevalent today than it's ever been. I wish I could live back in the old days when, you know, I, I heard a comedian say one time that, you know, in the old days there weren't any cell phones, right? And so if a cheating spouse's partner wanted to get in touch with them, they had to call the home phone. And there was only one, and it was in the kitchen next to the refrigerator. And so I like to see that person call, you know. Uh, the, the woman answers the phone, there's a lady on the other end that says, uh, can I please speak to Johnny? And you can just imagine the woman holding the phone, banging it up against the refrigerator. Who is this, right? Um, and so we, we, we seem to think that adultery is more prevalent because of our technology, but this was a huge problem in the ancient world. It's been a huge problem since, uh, since human beings were created and God started telling them to cleave together as one. So we know it's a big problem. And in Christian marriage, we promise to only be sexual 
with the person that we marry. And you know what? It's even more than that. We promise not only to not have sex with other people other than our partner, we promise not to be sexual in any way. Inappropriate touches, right? Bill Clinton tried to find the loophole. Did it work with Hillary? I don't think so. Right? And, and, not, and not only inappropriate physical touching, but in addition to that, it's inappropriate sharing with another person. Right? And I want you to think about how, how affairs tend to get started. It starts with a friendship. And then after the, after the friendship develops, then, uh, then there's some inappropriate sharing. They start sharing a little too much, a little more than they should with this person. Okay? And sometimes this takes the, uh, uh, takes the form of complaining about one of the guys. She always nags me. You know? So a friendship develops, there's some inappropriate sharing, and, uh, and then there's maybe some complaining about the spouse, and then we get to what's called the moment of maybe. The moment of maybe. And you begin to have these thoughts like, you know, I wonder if my spouse died, what would it be like to be with this person? If something happened to her, if something happened to her, I wonder what it would be like. Or even if you didn't have those kind of fantasies, you might just ask yourself the general question, I wonder what it would be like to be with this person. And then the boundary is crossed when one person says to the other, I wish you were more like my wife. Or I wish, I'm sorry, that's backwards. <laughs> I wish that my wife was more like you. Or I wish my husband was more like you. And then it's all downhill. Most affairs in the past have begun in the workplace. But today, the number one place where affairs get started is online. It's online. Especially <laughs> through Facebook. You know? When someone finds you, a person you dated 20 years ago, and they, they send you a message. You don't have to be friends to send messages. They send you a message and say, hey, I haven't seen you in forever. Are you happily married? Wink, wink, laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> just opens the door. <laughs> the Bible is very clear. Adultery is sin. It's not just a mistake. It's sinful. And if you are engaging in an adulterous affair, you might be able to hide it from your spouse, but God sees every single bit of it. And you will be held accountable. <coughs> it's time to come clean with your spouse, to stop the affair, and to get into couples therapy. Okay? If you have been the victim, if your spouse has cheated on you, that opens a wound that is very difficult to heal. And it's not impossible for people to work through infidelity. But the people that do are in the minority, and it's such a hard thing. Even Jesus says in Scripture, do not divorce except in case of adultery. And so not everybody can navigate that. If you are being tempted right now by an affair, I want you to turn with me. Well, even if you're not, you still want to turn with me. Because then you would know. Let's start flipping your Bibles and say, oh, Everybody, uh, turn with me to James chapter 1. Part of this is going to be up here on the screen. James chapter 1, beginning with uh, verse 14. This is how all sin starts, but this is particularly um, descriptive of what happens uh, when someone falls into the sin of adultery. It says this, but each one is tempted when... By his own, or one, each person is tempted by his own evil desire and is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. It starts with the moment of maybe an idea, I wonder what would happen. Evil desire is conceived, and if we entertain that too long, then it leads to actual sin, and the Bible says sin always has a dead-end street <coughs> into death. It'll kill your spirit. It'll kill your spirit, and sometimes it'll kill your body. So, um, how can we affair-proof our marriage? This is the last part of the message this morning. I want to give you some tips. 
If, even if you're not married, if you're in a long-term dating relationship, these are good things that you can do, especially if you're moving toward marriage, to lay the foundation. Um, and and here, here are a couple ideas. Number one, and, and, and I tell this to every couple that I counsel who wants to get married. I say, do not dare stand up in front of God in this church and say, I do, until you can make one promise that will save your marriage almost every single time. And that is this. Do not say or do anything in the absence of your spouse if you would not do that or say that when they were standing right next to you. Did you hear that? Do not say or do anything that you would not say or do if your spouse were not standing right beside you. And here's another important one. Do not send a text message or an email that you would not print out and give to your spouse to read. Okay? Again, if you, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't follow this rule, then you're going to find yourself enticed and dragged down by sin, as we saw in James, because that's always where it starts. Here's another one. Have a joint Facebook page. Have you thought about that? We have technology today. We've got cell phones that we have in our pocket. We can get text messages. You can be at dinner with your wife, and you can check your text, and you can get a text from your girlfriend, and she'll never know the difference. Right? Or if you're a woman, your boyfriend can text you or send you an email. You can check it. They never know the difference. Right? And so there's a sense in which we have crossed into a new era where trust is absolutely fundamental. But there are things that we can do, given this technology, in response to it, to avoid... Uh, any kind of indiscretion. Have a joint Facebook page. Don't, when you're married, you know, unless you're using it for business purposes, just have a joint page so that your spouse can read every post and every message and every IM, and that alleviates all kind of suspicion and can build <laughs> trust. Here's another one. Go to church together. Okay? Go to church together. Um, I want to share with you the results of a study done by the University of Chicago. Now, University of Chicago is not a Bible college, if anybody knows about the University of Chicago. Uh, but it is an elite college, one of the best colleges in the country. And in fact, their religion program is always consistently in the top five. Okay? And th these are the results of the University of Chicago General Social Surveys. And these are uh, the statistics related to how often people attend church and how often that correlates with those, someone in, in that couple having an affair. People that never go to church um, at all, there's a 24.8% likelihood that they might have an affair. Someone that goes to church once a month, it drops from 24.8 to 20.6. Then monthly, it drops to 17.19, and then weekly, 12.4. Now, that does not mean the couples that go to church together are never going to have affairs. <coughs> but what it does mean is that when you come to church together, it opens your heart to the possibility of the Holy Spirit keeping you honest, reminding you who you are, keeps you struggling with your sin, and continues to move you in the direction of looking like Jesus. And you know what? The more you look like <coughs> Jesus, the better spouse you're going to be. And the more your partner looks like Jesus, the better spouse he or she is going to be. And so go to church together. The next one is, don't keep secrets. Right? If someone flirts with you or acts inappropriately, go immediately and tell your spouse, after you have drawn a very clear line with that person and said, I'm married and this is inappropriate, then go and tell your spouse. Now, if you say, well, I can't do that because this person at work fortunately me all the time, my husband will kill him. Well, then you've got to work out a more long-term solution, right? You don't hang out and associate with people that flirt with you all the time. And if it's, if it's in the workplace, it's called sexual harassment. You go talk to your boss and get it fixed. So uh, don't keep secrets. Um, and share all of your passwords with your spouse. All of your computer passwords, your phone passwords, your internet passwords, Facebook passwords, share it with all of them. So that if they want to, and they probably won't ever do it, 
But if they want to, they can read your mail. Right? That creates an atmosphere of trust and holds you accountable to not doing, saying, or writing anything that you wouldn't do, write, or say if the spouse were standing right next to you. Next, we've only got two more and we'll be done. Okay, the next one is have mutually agreed upon boundaries of how you're going to deal with inappropriate behavior of others. You need to have a game plan with your spouse that if someone comes on to you or acts inappropriately to you, toward you, how are you going to respond to that? And let me tell you, the best way to respond to it is just to draw that line hard and fast and say, no, this is inappropriate. And you know, some people have a hard time with this because they think to themselves, I don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. Right? If I, if I come on too strong and say no and draw the line, then they might think that I'm a mean person or a bad person and I might hurt their feelings. Well, guess what? Sometimes you've got to choose. Would you rather protect the feelings of the person who is being disrespectful and acting inappropriately toward you, or would you rather protect the feelings of your spouse? That just seems like a no-brainer to and so it's not an excuse to want to protect the feelings of the person that's coming on to you because the person that's come on to you, especially if they know you're married, is acting disrespectful toward you and your spouse and is acting in inappropriate ways. And you need to have a plan so that when it happens, you're not caught by surprise going, oh, oh, oh like the chest of the teeth. And then finally, finally, final tip for a fair proof in your marriage. I'm a little goofy sometimes. You just have to love it It is play it forward. Before you do it, follow it through and think about the consequences. Oftentimes, maybe almost every time, when people engage in illicit affairs and they cheat on their boyfriend or girlfriend, it's always because they're caught up in a moment of passion and they don't give any thought to what would happen if it came out. Remember, even if you can hide it from your spouse for a while, God sees it. There are, there are consequences with God. But, you know, eventually people get caught. Or eventually your conscience will become so overburdened with guilt that you're going to have to dump it on your spouse. And guess what? A vast majority of the time, the one that's been cheated on is going to say, hasta la vista, baby. Get out of my house. And you will lose everything. You will lose your family. You will lose your kids. You could lose your job. You will certainly lose your dignity and your self -control. And there is healing and there is grace. But that is a long and painful process. And we would rather not have to go through that because it's just not necessary. And so, in conclusion this morning, I just want to say that, that marriage is about us being a blessing to another person. Building them up. Helping them to be the best that they can be. It is an overflowing of love and respect for the other person. And it is a beautiful thing. But because we are fallen, sinful human beings, the devil is always knocking at the door of your heart, trying to drive a wedge between you and the person that God has given to you as a gift. And so you have to be intentional and you have to be vigilant about these things. So this morning, I just want to end with a prayer. And I want everybody in here to close their eyes, if you would, please. I just want to say that if you are a victim of abuse, if you are living in the hell of an addict who is active in their addiction and has no desire to get clean, or if you are the victim or suspect adultery. I just want you to know that God loves you this morning. And there is healing. There is grace. There is nothing that God can't heal in your heart that is broken. And we're going to pray for you this morning and give you an opportunity to come forward and pray as well. If you are an abuser, if you are an addict, if you are someone who is thinking about an adulterous affair or has committed adultery or is engaged in adultery, there is healing and forgiveness for you, friend. There's no sin that God can't forgive. There's no form of bondage that God can't break. And there's healing. And so we want to pray for you too. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. 
We thank you so much, Lord, that no matter how many times other people break our hearts and betray us, that you are ever faithful, never, ever, ever leaving us, that you have the power to heal. We're just so grateful for that, Lord. And for anybody here that is hurting and broken because of one of these three things, I pray right now that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon them, that you will wash through their mind and their hearts and their bodies, allow them to feel in a tangible way right now, Lord, the power of your presence and your love and your healing. Lead them to a place, God, where they can have enough courage, strength, and hope to get help for themselves. Because we know that you love them, God, and you don't want them to be victimized in any way because they are your child. For those, Lord, who are struggling with addiction or anger and are being abusive, for those who are struggling with difficulty in their marriage and being tempted or engaged in adultery, we pray, Lord, that you will just convict their heart right now so that no one leaves here that has not felt the conviction of your spirit and hearing the words of hope that there is forgiveness and there is healing. Continue to move among us, Lord, as the praise man comes and leads us in our song of response. We don't want to lose your presence as we have encountered it already this morning. So we ask that you will continue to pour out your Holy Spirit, meeting each and every person exactly where they are right now, Lord, in their life giving them what they need to get it cleaned up and to get back on the right track if they're straight away from you or to give them the courage and the wisdom to take the next step to becoming more like Jesus. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand and join me in our song of response.